Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this very special edition of Art Journalism Network webinar. Today, we are going to discuss a very crucial issue, which is land rights in indigenous people's territories and their significance on the conservation of biodiversity. And since we are all journalists, of course, we are also going to discuss the role of media in all of this. I'm Stella Paul, Environment and Health Project Officer at EJN, and I'm your moderator for the day. Today, I'm very excited to moderate a panel of women indigenous uh, experts from Asia Pacific, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, I'll be introducing them very shortly to you. But before that, a sentence or two about a bit of housekeeping here. Um, we will be uh, listening to our experts for the first one hour of this uh, program today. And then we have half hour specifically allotted question and answers. But we encourage you to go on posting your questions uh, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be keeping an eye on your questions. And once uh, we open up the floor, uh, we will be taking these questions to our experts. Uh, please do not post your questions in the chat box because we are going to monitor only the Q&A section. Uh, and if you have any questions that for some reason cannot be answered today, we are definitely going to be record, you know, share this recording and we'll make sure that you do get your answer now or later. So with that, let me now uh, introduce you to our panelists of the day. Uh, first on my screen is Bestang Dektekin. Uh, Bestang is uh, a very vocal and quite well known in, in, in the Asia region. She uh, is from uh, Cordillera People's Alliance and she is a land rights champion from the Philippines. Bestang, welcome to our panel today. Thank you and good evening everyone from the Philippines. Uh, next on the panel is Diana. Diana Karakiri Terimba, she is a journalist from uh, Kampala, uh, Uganda, and she has been somebody who has reported on the land rights issues and how uh, the land rights in the indigenous territories have been affected by uh, industrial activities. We will be listening to uh, Diana today, uh, as well as uh, her reporting experience. So Diana, welcome. Thank you, Stella. Good evening, everyone. Greetings from Kampala, Uganda. And last but not least, we have Annabella Carlon Flores. Uh, Annabella, if you can turn on your camera, I know you are having uh, some uh, issues with the internet, but yes, there she is. Annabella is a lawyer and uh, a campaigner from Mexico. Uh, and uh, Annabella also has uh, some very intense uh, stories about her personal struggle to defend land rights in indigenous territories. So Annabella, welcome. Thank you, good morning to everyone and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Annabella, it's pretty early in Mexico. So we are very glad that you could be joining us despite uh, it being so early. And um, thank you uh, to, to everybody who has um, registered and who has joined us now. And we will continue to welcome everybody who keeps on joining us now or later. So with that, um, I will now uh, come to you, Annabella, first. Uh, before I ask you uh, a question, uh, one thing that I want uh, our all of those who have joined us here to remember is that probably the, the reason why we are here to discuss land rights in indigenous territories. Indigenous people 
actually uh, comprise only 5% of the global population, which is 370 million roughly across the world. But when it comes to biodiversity, almost 80% of the global biodiversity, uh, including rich mineral resources, forest resources, are in the homeland of indigenous people. Now, uh, Annabella, under, you are a lawyer and you, you, you definitely uh, have much more insight into that. But one thing that I keep thinking of is that under international law, it is very clearly stated that indigenous peoples cannot be forcefully relocated. And if they have to leave, if they have to relocate to another, another area, it has to be on with an informed and free consent. But still, every single day we keep getting, we keep keep hearing about forced forced dis displacement, forced relocation, eviction, and so on. So, from your experience, tell us what is the status in your in your homeland in Mexico in general, and how do they impact the conservation of biodiversity? The floor is yours, Annabelle. Thank you, and it's a very good question. And I would like to talk from our experience in our own case about the Jackie case specifically. I would like to start with that. Uh, I come from Loma de Bacum, uh, a Jaki village, and they begin to they began to defend the ancestral land when in 2016. In 2016, and against the Agua Prieta gas pipeline. The fight began to defend our rights to self-determination or right to decide our future. We knew that we had the right to be consulted and that our, con and that our consent has to be prior, prior, free and informed. So when people from the company of our, our Prieta pipeline and Senair, they began to connect with Iraqi people, contacts and organize a trip to Puerto Peñasco for the tribal authorities for a presentation for the construction of the gas line uh, along to Sonora. Then we, then we, then look like everything will go all right because they are started with presentation and informing. Uh, but in 2015, this official from Genova and Senair began to appear in the Jackie towns in our territory to make consultation according to the highest international human rights standards. But in the same in the same year, like in one month after, they started pressuring because they were in a hurry, because they had to start the construction or they would have to pay a fine for not, for not compliance. And, and we were thinking as community, as com a Jackie community, this consultation or this consent is not going to be free because they are pushing. So um, uh, one month, Later, the authorities of my community were visited by very, various emissaries, Jackies and non jackies with gift, invitation, food, money, and some and some women also received visits from friends of the gas pipeline to offer them job offers, financing for their person and organization to start questioning the gas pipeline project through Jackie territory. The next day, we were having an important meeting because we wanted, we wanted to consult ourselves. And by consensus, the people of Loma de Bacum decided not to be consulted. And then the official from the company, Genova, 
and Senair were, were there, although they were not invited to that meeting. Upon knowing the result of the meeting, they left immediately before the document with the decision of the meeting were handed over to them. And was not prior free and informed the consent, the consultation. It was just covering administrative requirement. We, we, we are saying that it wasn't previous because it was already being built some, from some point, which no longer is the same prior because the project had already begun and the construction company representative said that the construction's almost reaching the Yaki territory. How can that be prior? It wasn't free either, the consultation, because they canceled the scholarship from for students from Loma de Bacum who has a scholarship from a scholarship from the State Commission for the Development of Indigenous People of Sonora. Many mothers were also treated with suspending their prospera support. Houses were being built, which were also suspended, and just last year were finished. And if the pressure, the media is discrediting, minimizing the community and criminalizing the most visible people, offering money and projects in exchange for signing the consent to be consulted is not longer free either. The social rights uh, are already, already belong to us and we do not have to change it for the project of this type. When we were asking for more information for to be informed, we requested more information on the different impacts, not only on how it is going to be built, how many meters wide, long, deep size, or the tube is monitoring or is danger. According to these people, they present the advantages to the community, like the land will increase in value, which is not an advantage for us, will attract industries and investment, to our territory, of course, is not an advantage for us. Also, they said that the Jackie tribe has never seen so many millions together. For all these reasons, the community decided to take legal action in April 2016. Uh, Bakun filed an injunction against the violation of the rights as indigenous people. The judge of the court ordered the suspension of the activities of the construction company. But in October of that, the same year, there was a clash where unknown people together with Jackies attacked our community to impose a new traditional authority on us to give consent. A man in favor of gas pipeline lost his life. For this, they blamed a member of the traditional guard that today he is in jail unjustly sentenced to 15 years for a crime he didn't commit. Fidencio Aldama Perez was carrying a 45 caliber weapon that has been seized from hunters. The person who lost his life was wooden with a 22 caliber weapon. We were criminalized for having links with drug traffickers to be stealing gasoline in the Pemex pipelines. That was the main reason why we, did, we didn't want the gas pipeline in our land. Also, in 2015, I was kidnapped along with my husband to intimidate the community so they would stop defending their territory. In this case, the media um, didn't help, help us a lot <laughs> uh, because the action that the people of Loma de Bacum were doing were being minimized by the media. In a local media, it was published that the dual authority is opposed to the development of Ciudad Obregón and Southern Sonora. And all this, all this happens because uh, Yaqui people's way of decision making is not by majority, it's by consensus. In the media, it was emphasized 
that the majority of the Yaqui people has already made the decision and gave their consent. And only a small group of agitators were promoting this situation because they wanted more money. We never accept the exaggerated offer of money that they offer, nor the project that they wanted to finance either. We were accused of all possible opposition, like the opposition political party and a group of company finances violence provocators was formed. And as a Yaqui people, and we observed other situation, not only in our nation, also in other, other indigenous peoples. We as community make visible the possible aggression that they would cause because it is already <clears throat> a patron of the companies along with the state. When we all, <clears throat> excuse me, when we'll develop a fresh project, mega project or mining, they are going to try to create representative who will sign their consent. And so it works. Now there are people who show themselves as the representative in Loma de Baco. When they don't have the support of the social base, it doesn't cover the requirements that a Yaqui government must cover, but it's not important for the state much less for a construction company that develops a poor project. Without having the consent of the indigenous people of Loma de Paco, the construction of the gas line began because the municipality gave permission without consulting us, knowing that there was an injunction. Government always tell us that they are respectful to our way of making decision that is just a political speech. So today we have 10 people missing since July 14, 2021. Organized crime has been taken advantage of this situation or mining company. That we see many inconsistencies. First, there was no access to the investigation folder, and then some bond remains found as well as the state to continue criminalizing us since illegal situation has been found during the searches. But when the media publish it, they point out all the criminal acts in our village of Bakum. Is there an agreement or is mere coincidence? Lastly, I want to say that our territory doesn't belong to the majority. It belongs to, the, to everyone when making important decisions regarding the land and the future is everyone's responsibility, not only of those who are going to sign on behalf of the community. So we know about our rights locally and also internationally, but when we, are want, we want to enjoy them, we cannot do it. Thank you. Thank you, Annabella. Quite a few points you highlighted for journalists here today, listening uh, to Annabella. There are already a few story ideas that I think Annabella gave us. One thing is, uh, who is signing the, the consent? And are they the true representatives of the of the community? And she mentioned, uh, you know, something about people who have gone missing. How did they go missing? Where are they? I think there is a lot of scope of investigative uh, reporting when it comes to indigenous uh, land rights and displacement. So it goes just way beyond uh, a, a case filed here and a case filed there, or maybe far, far beyond a particular family or, or, or one person being affected. It, it goes deep into human rights. It goes deep into corruption. And of course, uh, the, the, the nexus between 
probably different parties and how how they all snowball into uh, something that that then affects the well well being of, of local communities who again as we began with uh, is, is is the front line you know the, the defend on the front line of defending the biodiversity so uh, with that um, i would now uh, if we can just just uh, pause uh, for for a second uh, this uh, the presentation and um, i would call uh, best tongue who ha has joined us from the Philippines. So, uh, Bestang, uh, we know that 70% uh, of the indigenous people of the world live in Asia Pacific. Uh, our overwhelming majority, of course. Uh, but does it mean that, you know, the, 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 their sheer presence is actually helping in getting it right. Um, uh, thing, you, you are someone who have been uh, leading uh, the, the ground movement in, in, you know, in Philippines, in, in Asia, uh, and I think you have you have uh, earlier, you know, we have heard you in different forums speak about, uh, you know, growing criminalization of people who have been trying to defend the land rights. So please take us, take us to, to this and help us understand uh, what's, the, what's the status of land rights and those who struggle uh, to defend it in Asia. Yes, thank you, Stella. And then again, good morning, uh, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone. What I will be sharing uh, I will be sharing more of our experience in the in the Cordillera region in northern Luzon. That's the red spot that you see. Uh, that's the map of the Philippines, and that's where I am. But much of what I will talk about is quite similar with the case of uh, indigenous peoples in the Philippines and the experiences of many indigenous peoples uh, in Asia, especially uh, in, in our region in Southeast Asia. So yeah, uh, I live in, in this mountainous region called the Cordillera, uh, whose majority population are indigenous peoples. There's fifth, around 15 million of us indigenous peoples, or 15% uh, of the total population in the Philippines. Uh, indigenous peoples' lands, uh, territories, are known to be rich in minerals in our region, it's especially rich in uh, gold and copper. And then because we are a mountainous region, our rivers supply fresh water to the nearby low-lying areas. And as indigenous peoples, of course, our lands are the, and the natural resources, they sustain our living and also our culture and uh, even our identity. So we always say that land is our life, which is true because our existence is very much tied to the land. And without it, we will cease to exist as indigenous peoples. Uh, well, the problem is that in, in my region, for instance, for more than 100 years now, private corporations, especially transnational mining and energy companies, have been targeting the resources that we have in our territories. So in the next slide, we call it development aggression. Uh, that's what you see in the next slide. The natural resources that we have are attracting a lot of investors, especially from the international, uh, the international community. But in our region at the moment, there are already three existing large-scale mining operations and uh, hydropower dams, which were built since as early as 1904. So throughout many decades, we have seen the destruction that such projects can cause, including the displacement of communities, economic dislocation, and massive environmental destruction. In fact, until now, whenever there are strong typhoons or uh, you may call it hurricanes, the areas most affected, like those ones experiencing massive landslides that bury houses and even communities, are the mining areas. And the lowlands are experiencing massive flooding due to the release of huge volumes of water from the hydropower dams. Climate change is real, and we have seen the strongest typhoons in recent years in the Philippines, and we know that the situation will be much worse, especially if we allow the destruction of our remaining forests, lands, 
and biodiversity. So, indigenous peoples, we have been opposing large-scale mining, dams, and other destructive projects. But then, the companies are not just leaving, even if even if we tell them to. Uh, in the next slide, you see a map. Right now, in my region, in the Cordillera, there are more than 100 applications for large-scale large mining and at least 87 hydropower projects that have been awarded by our Department of Energy. So uh, next slide. In this map, in the map, the, mark, the areas marked in yellow, those are the applications for large-scale mining projects. And the text on both sides and the numbers, uh, never mind reading, this is just to show uh, the numbers of proposed energy projects. So if all of these projects will push through, then nothing will be left of our lands and resources. Nothing will be left for our children and grandchildren to live in. In the next photo, um, so we have to struggle to defend our lands and our right to self-determination as indigenous peoples. And we continue to do that. Of course, one reason why this is the situation is because these companies and their projects are backed by the Philippine government, even if it does not substantially contribute to the national economy, as opposed to what the government and the corporations are claiming. In fact, the Philippine mining law allows a complete sellout of our resources and national patrimony. It allows 100% foreign ownership of our lands and resources for up to 50 years. But we know that with 50 years of large scale mining, the land will become dirt due to pollution and destruction. And already we are seeing it now, as you can see in the photos. These are recent uh, photos. So generally speaking, mm -hmm. The state, the Philippines, uh, the Philippine government treats our ter territories as a resource base at the cost of indigenous peoples and the environment. And even if there is an indigenous peoples' rights law in the Philippines, in reality, on the ground, there is lack of recognition of our rights because. There are these laws, like the mining law, that directly violate indigenous people's rights. And these are the ones that are being uh, implemented by the government. So um, like what Anna has shared, our right to free prior and informed consent or giving consent or non-consent to certain projects, which is recognized even in our law, uh, these are constantly violated as well. And this are happening even right now at the time of pandemic when we obviously have much greater problems that we should face as a nation. And so we fight. We fight to defend our lands and resources, our self-determination and our human rights. However, uh, in doing so, the state, especially through the military and the police, is maligning us. They are labeling us as terrorists and criminalizing our struggles. Our communities are heavily militarized even up to the moment. So um, next slide, let me just go back quickly to the map again. The, uh, next, in the next slide, the, the map that you see, which was shown also earlier, the green icons there are where the military troops are concentrated. Can we go to the next slide? And uh, you know, it is notable that where there are active opposition against mining or dump projects, that is also where there is militarization. Uh, well, as you may already know from the report of Global Witness last year, the Philippines ranks third in the world's deadliest countries for land and environment defenders. In 2019, we were at the top and many of those uh, state perpetrated killings were indigenous leaders and activists. Before the pandemic, President Duterte implemented a whole of government approach to end insurgency because uh, there is civil war in the country. But the problem is that this policy targets government critics, activists, as indigenous peoples who are speaking against these destructive projects like dams and mining, even my organization, the Cordillera People's Alliance, which they are trying to delegitimize and, and silence. So in the communities, as we face the intrusion of mining and energy projects on a day-to-day -day basis, we are experiencing harassment from the military and police. In the next slide, you will see photos here 
during COVID, COVID, at least three of our leaders faced trump up charges, and all of these charges were filed by the police. Uh, one is Cord Cordillera People's Alliance Chairperson, Mr. Wendell Bulingan, uh, who was charged with trump up case of murder, and he was even subjected to a shoot-to-kill order by the police, but due to a strong pressure including uh, by United Nations experts and, of course, the lack of evidence the case was dropped last year. There's also this fierce woman, Betty Belen, uh, who was released after four months of imprisonment during COVID. And uh, finally, a cyber libel case was filed by the police against me when I spoke about the desecration of our hero's monument last year. And the case is still ongoing. Uh, well, cyber libel cases against government critics is not new. So if you have been following the news, the prominent Philippine journalist who was recently awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, her name is Maria Reza, is facing quite a number of cyber libel cases. So as you can see, apart from the killings and harassment and the intrusion of destructive projects in our lands, the state is also trying to cripple our organizations by weaponizing the laws against us, by filing Trump up charges against us. They are calling us terrorists when in fact the real terrorist here is the state and we are all doing, what we are all doing is simply defending our lands for the sake of future generations, which is in no way an act of terrorism. Um, in the next slide, yeah, I just want to say that what the state is doing is resulting in fear. We are humans, so yes, we feel fear. We fear for our lives. Uh, our lives are in fact at stake at the moment. But at the same time, we cannot stop from defending our lands, from defending our rights and our culture. So, so we remain standing, we remain resolute in this fight. And as one of our heroes has said, until our right to self-determination is recognized, the struggle will not end. And even if it means the sacrifice our lives, the sacrifice of our lives to achieve freedom, then so be it. He was a victim of extrajudicial killing by the state in 20, 2006, and he remains to inspire us. I will end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Bestang. Um, quite a few points here to, to remember. Um, First, of course, uh, quite a strong statement on how do you define terrorism? And, uh, you know, the, the best time speaking from the perspective of indigenous people who are drawn into uh, a relentless struggle to defend, uh, I think it's uh, as she began by saying, it's a matter of, you know, sustaining themselves. It's a matter, pure matter of life. So. I guess that's where the, the, the statement comes from. We are getting some uh, quite good questions and I do encourage uh, everybody to post your questions. We will be addressing them uh, later on. Um, one more thing that Bestang said is that <clears throat> she, uh, I think this, this was common, but Annabella also talked about mining, although she was uh, referring to uh, oil and gas mining there, the setting, laying of the gas pipeline. And Bestang uh, shared with us <clears throat> what's happening uh, with the gold and copper deposit and gold and copper mining along with others. And uh, this uh, reminds me of uh, a story that our third panelist of the day, Diana, has recently highlighted in her story. Um, Diana uh, did uh, a very, um, uh, very, very powerful report on how gold mining is causing <clears throat> widespread damage to uh, the land and water resources in Uganda's Karomja uh, region. So, Diana, take us there and tell us. Uh, tell us what what have you seen? What have you been reporting on? as a journalist and also while you are doing it, I would like, like you to, to say something about, uh, you know, we, we heard two of our panelists say like how some stories that deserve to be in the limelight are not quite highlighted by media. So if you can also uh, tell us, 
you know, what are the constraints that uh, journalists themselves feel and why cannot they uh, report the stories uh, that deserve to be reported? So take it from here, Diana. Thank you, Stella. Uh, yes, as introduced, my name is Diana Tarima Karachire and I am a freelance journalist uh, based here in Uganda. I'm an EGN, Indigenous Story Grantee from last year. And uh, that story grant helped me to work on a story about uh, the Karamojo people here in Uganda. They are an indigenous people. And the story was about uh, the impact of mining on these indigenous people. So um, there's already a call for applications this year still on the same grants. So I would really encourage journalists to apply so that they are able to amplify um, all these issues facing um, indigenous people as, as highlighted by uh, the previous speakers. So uh, the good thing, the previous speakers have really made my work easy. So I'm basically going to be talking about uh, reporting on indigenous people. Yes, and how we as journalists can go about that. And yeah, that, that's basically it for my presentation. Next slide, please. So why, first of all, the question is why, why report on these people? So um, uh, as journalists, it's our duty to raise awareness about the issues that affect uh, an indigenous people uh, because uh, these are not, these are not uh, issues that you find highlighted in our everyday media. Um, um, I'll, you find that in most cases, uh, editors are more interested in the stories of the day, the politics of the day, but uh, there's, there's little interest in uh, the issues that affect, uh, some of these issues that affect indigenous people. So we need to raise awareness so that we create public debate about these issues, but also uh, to ensure that there's policy action from our policy makers and ensure that there's change uh, that actually impacts on these people. Uh, uh, the next point is spotlight the plight of indigenous people. So uh, my, my story on the Karamoja, uh, on the Karamojong people of Uganda basically uh, highlighted uh, what they were going through with uh, big oil mine co mining companies. There's uh, the human rights violations there's environmental pollution in the region from these mining companies. And I'm glad to report that currently the government of Uganda is um, in the process of putting in place a new law that is going to address most of these issues that I raised in my, in my story. And so this is why we should tell these stories so that there's policy action. And also the need to amplify the voices of these people. So, um, Indigenous people already have a voice, but we need to amplify their voices so that they articulate their issues to the policy makers. And then to also promote the protection of their rights. You find, um, I'll give an example. In Uganda, most of the, most of the indigenous peoples are, are a minority, are, are, are minority people and at the same time marginalized groups. So you will find that uh, there's need to promote the protection of their rights and even then you find that even the existing laws are insufficient in terms of protecting their rights. So if we do not raise their, their problems, if we do not highlight their plight, there's no way there's going to be policy reforms uh, that recognize these people's rights, recognize their problems. Yes, next slide. Yes, I talked about marginalization. So there's also a, grow, a growing trend where governments have continued to appropriate indigenous people's lands for development activities that have further disenfranchised these indigenous people. So our stories should also highlight that if there are big oil companies, if there are big mining companies, 
how are they impacting on these people's lives? And we need to, how, how are, are people involved in all these processes? If an oil company is supposed to undertake an ESIA, an environmental impact assessment, are the local people involved? Are there voices there? So we need to highlight all these issues. And then also the, the, the other, there's a global discourse around environmental justice. Uh, environmental justice is kind of a new concept in Africa, the fair treatment of all groups of people with respect to environmental protection re remains largely at international level. So that's still what I was talking about, involvement of these people in all these processes that uh, actually impact on them. If, if these are ESIAs, do they involve these people? Are they involved in decision making of, of their land? Are they involved in, in land acquisition processes? Are the women involved? So our, our stories must inv investigate all these social, social issues so that we are able to uh, ultimately ensure the protection of uh, indigenous groups. Next slide. So um, some tips when you're reporting about uh, indigenous people. Uh, there, there are very many stories out there about indigenous people, say from India, from wherever, but you can, every time you read those stories, try to localize the story as a journalist. How does, is this, if you look at um, an international story, um, and this is a question I always ask myself every time I see a story, uh, say in international media, how, how is this how how is this story similar to other stories in my country? Yeah. So try to localize the story, give it a local angle. What is happening in your country, and then project it and give it a broader um, perspective or an international perspective. And then do research. Look out for these stories. There are several several institutions, the NGOs that work on these issues, try to follow up with them. What are they doing around indigenous rights? What are they doing for indigenous peoples? Follow up with those organizations so that they're able to give you good story tips so that you're able to see what are they doing? Are, these, are, uh, are the things they're doing worth the stories? And when I say this, I do not mean become a PR person for uh, a non-government organization doing indigenous um, work around indigenous issues. No, look at what they are doing and try to create stories around that. Um, ensure that you balance your story. Uh, balancing means including all perspectives. Talk to, talk to the mining companies that are violating indigenous people's rights. Talk to government officials. Uh, I have a bad experience uh, talking to government officials. Sometimes you'll go for weeks with unanswered emails. Uh, phone calls are not answered, but uh, the good thing I have been able to build a contact database and then I'm also able to talk to other journalists to help me with contacts. So yes, ensure you balance your story, diversity and gender inclusiveness. Ensure that your story is balanced. There's that, that aspect of gender balance. Talk to the men, talk to the women because these issues affect uh, the two genders differently. They affect women differently. They affect uh, men differently. They, they affect the LGBT community differently. So you need that inclusiveness, build confidence with the community. You know, um, this is an experience actually that, uh, that, that, that this is something that I experienced from here. I find that uh, when you go into indigenous territories, sometimes you're not as, you're looked at as a foreigner, there's that fear. So in order to, to build confidence with the people you want to interview, uh, maybe you could move around with a local leader Maybe you could look for a local activist or opinion leader to move around with so that you interview local, local people, local community people. Yes. Um, like I said, develop a contact database. Um, every time I read a report, say, from a non government organization, an institution that works around indigenous people's issues, I look out for the names of who wrote the report. And then I'll, I'll, I'll look up for the. I'll look up and check them out, may say on Twitter, on LinkedIn, so that I'm able to get their contacts. And in case I have a story, then I already have my very good database of people, um, of sources that I can talk to. Next slide. 
So some of the challenges we encounter in trying to tell these stories, finding sources, and for me especially, finding female sources, <laughs> that is a problem. But um, but you keep trying. You keep um, we, with experience. You get to have all these contacts that you build with time. And when there are press events, try to attend in your country, try to attend so that you get uh, contacts of people, contacts of uh, government officials. And also uh, be sure to differentiate between an expert and uh, an opinion leader. So uh, this, is, this, is also, this is also an experience from here in Uganda. You'll find uh, people interviewing opinion leaders instead of experts. So find the right people to talk to, find the right experts. Um, the other challenge, unanswered calls, unanswered emails, uh, and this became worse with the pandemic. Uh, of course, you have to be um, uh, sympathetic. People are going through a lot. Be patient with people. Uh, try as other means of uh, interviewing people. Use, use Zoom, use your phones, um, because people are going through a lot and sometimes they might not answer you but keep trying. So finding sources or, or grants uh, specifically to tell these stories um, can also be a challenge, but I'm glad that EGN has, has put out opportunities for us as journalists to tell these stories of indigenous peoples, but um, they are there, but still limited. And also financial support to find, uh, to, to, to support investigations. Sometimes you'll have a story tip but you can't you you do not have the finance uh to the resources to conduct the investigation so that also remains a challenge for us as journalists but also um uh one one of the ways of 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 managed uh this this specific challenge is also with collaborations uh with other journalists so maybe you might not have the resources but uh you your, your friends, your journalist friends from other media houses could be able to pitch these stories to their, to their editors and get the necessary resources. So that collaboration also helps with this. Uh, and then less interest from editors. You'll find some editors actually not interested in these stories at the time. So that also can be a challenge. Inadequate capacity to report on indigenous groups. So as journalists, that's also a challenge. Uh, we just need to um keep taking taking advantage of the trainings that are available to to improve our skills to gain more knowledge such webinars as this are also a very good platform to learn and and uh and get expert contacts and and get interviews with people next slide Yes, so with those few words, I'd like to thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Diana. Sorry. Um, quite a lot uh, here <laughs> to, to, to take home uh, already. A um, few things that actually stood out and I would like to uh, stress on one of those, especially finance. Uh, something that we all face yet few of us actually talk about. Uh, one, one universal uh, truth is that most indigenous activists, opinion leaders, and uh, campaigners uh, do uh, complain about is that their stories, the real stories of people's real struggle are not often uh, reported by media. Uh, on the other side, uh, the indigenous territories are often far away. They are in remote locations. So newsrooms uh, don't always find it very uh, feasible, very cost-friendly, uh, you know, uh, budget-friendly to uh, assign somebody to go there on a one-off story. And, you know, so, so uh, lack of enough budgetary allocation is a perennial problem that most journalists uh, work with. And as Diana just mentioned, uh, is that Earth Journalism Network keeps uh, 
you know, offering tips, uh, giving, uh, com coming up with, uh, you know, grants uh, to journalists, not just financial grants, but also mentorship, uh, who, so dedicated mentors can then uh, guide the selected journalists to see that the stories are well uh, executed, stories are well done, and to, to extend that they become impactful, they can get their desired impact, reach the targeted audience. And one thing we all understand and probably we all will agree is that when you do a story and the story creates impact, uh, whether it's a public debate or whether it's being uh, discussed uh, in the, among the policymakers or by a large section of the society, uh, this, this impact then kind of creates a chain reaction. Uh, it inspires other journalists, uh, the rest of the media to go and uh, focus on that story. And it also inspires, uh, encourages the newsroom to invest uh, more and take a different outlook, a uh, you know, different look at this particular story. Uh, so uh, I will be uh, strongly encourage all of you who are uh, working, whether it's freelance journalist or part of a newsroom, please do visit our journalism website and do apply to our, uh, our, our story grant calls. Uh, one of the story grant call is right now, we are, uh, we are accepting applications for indigenous uh, people's issues. So please uh, do set, uh, pitch today. Uh, and uh, we have just extended the deadline for another week. Um, so please uh, do apply to our indigenous people story grant. Uh, with that, uh, I will now come to Annabella uh, for uh, your final message of the day. If you have a key message, if you want everybody who have joined us today to remember one thing uh, from this webinar, what, what is that? What is your main message for the audience today? Okay. <clears throat> I you have, don't... you have, to, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> Thank this. you. Okay. I don't know if I've mentioned this, but I was saying that the land is life itself in for our Jackie life. And in that space where our ancestors developed their knowledge about plants, animals, climate, agriculture cycles, and, and all that that is known as traditional knowledge, knowledge um, that territory has inspired them, inspired our song or languages, or rituality. And where history has been written and the remind of ancestor rests for the defense of this space. Therefore, is our obligation, is our obligation to defend, transmit the history, the songs, the language, the food system. And I think we should do for this, the same for the planet because it's or and we don't have another place. Thank you. Thank you, Annabella. Uh, we next go to Bestang. Bestang, what is your key message for today? Yeah, thank you, Stella. Uh, there's so much to say, no? But it is important to note that what we are fighting for with the indigenous peoples is not just for our sake, but this is also for societies and the whole of humanity uh, because defending lands and the environment is for the benefit of all of us uh, in, and more importantly, the next generations. But we, the indigenous peoples know that we cannot win the battles alone. We need the support and solidarity of the international community and of journalists and the mass media because the real truth must be the ones that come out and we have already experienced how the support from the international community and international media coverage has helped in our local struggles because this helped put pressure on the philippine government to act on our demands so we hope that this can be continued and that more journalists are informed and write stories on the issues that we face on land rights 
and on the criminalization of our struggles so that the world may know and more will contribute in the actions. So yeah, I'd like to reiterate that our land is our life and activism is not terrorism. Thank you. We hear you, uh, Bestang. Um, and Diana, what is your final message uh, as a journalist? Um, as journalists, let's tell these stories about indigenous peoples. Their stories are important. It's the only way we shall get our policy makers take action so that, this, so that these people's lives are bettered and their rights are protected. Thank you, Diana. Before we uh, go into Q&A section, um, I would like to just summarize a few uh, points that kind of jumped out at me, uh, brought up by our panelists here. Uh, I, uh, I, I also saw that there is a question here so uh, uh, related to the mining and the economic importance of uh, industrialization. And I'm pretty sure our, our uh, panelists will be um, you know, uh, answering to that. But I just want to say that what I could, uh, you know, what I could uh, figure out from uh, listening to Annabella and Bestang especially is that when we talk about growth and and uh, you know economic prosperity, we also have to remember that we are we should be talking about inclusive growth because that is a fundamental, uh, uh, you know, component of the SDGs as well. So defending the land rights of a minority community or a particular community is not something that is out of the box or something that is beyond the parameters of economic prosperity or economic growth. It is just that we are go, you know, doing it right uh, by what the SDGs uh, or, or the UN actually, you know, uh, or the, our you know, global leaders have agreed to do. Uh, the second thing that I, uh, I, I heard is that, as Pastor just said, that it's, uh, it's, it's not a fight of, the, uh, uh, of, of, of a particular community alone. Uh, when uh, the land, uh, you know, people, uh, indigenous people are uh, denied or are, uh, you know, evicted or displaced from the land, uh, it is then leading to the damage also of the biodiversity you know of that particular land now if biodiversity and there is environmental damage uh, then uh, happening there and there's uh, no no community nobody no uh, you know um, uh, no vigilantes as as i would say uh, there to check that uh, it's also leading to uh, it is uh, the the loss. It, it would be a loss for the entire population, not just of a particular community. Uh, Diana mentioned uh, the need of collaboration. Uh, I would say that's an excellent point, and we are seeing more and more of that happening across the world. Alone, uh, as Bestang said, alone we can't win it, but together we can. The same applies to the journalistic fraternity that. Maybe alone, I can't cover this story because it's way too big. It's uh, the location is way too far. Uh, my resources are not enough, but then I can always join hands with another journalist. And maybe uh, there can be a collaborative journalism uh, to do. And then there are all these finance, uh, financial grants and fellowships and trainings available these days. So I would again encourage everybody to, to look out for them. And when you do come across them, do apply. Don't shy away from that. Uh, a very important thing Annabella mentioned just now is the traditional knowledge of the indigenous people. This has been highlighted and uh, actually has been, uh, you know, time and again uh, mentioned by several uh, academics, researchers, uh, IPTC included, and the UN, that the traditional knowledge of uh, the indigenous peoples are a great asset and it's integral, it's very important to defend, uh, to, to conserve the biodiversity and uh, the environment in general. 
So that is something. And then there are so many stories lying around this traditional knowledge, whether it's medicinal plants, whether it's uh, weather forecasting, early warning system uh, as well. Uh, and then there are all these stories around you know, uh, you know, the finding the loopholes and how this is being exploited by different parties, uh, such as you know, being the consent. As Diana mentioned, is it is it truly fair? Is it truly informed consent? So overall, I think uh, we had a lot of story ideas that could be developed from our panelists today. But of course, we are now going into the Q and A section, uh, and I'm sure. When they answer your questions, you will find more to take home. So with that, I thank you, our panelists, and let's now open the floor for the question and answers. So first of all, um, there is a question uh, that is especially for, uh, OK, I don't see that question. That was one uh, for Annabella. Uh, I don't see that anymore. Um, OK. Uh, have, uh, okay, some questions have already been answered. That is fantastic. Um, oh, how do you, there is one question <laughs> that say, how do you consider indigenous journalists? Thank you. I don't know that, who that question is uh, directed at, uh, but um, uh, probably you can you can uh, I would say that do visit uh, our if you if this is from a journalist who wants to know uh, the answer then please do visit uh, our website and we have an ongoing application for indigenous uh, journalists uh, when you go into when you start to apply you can see who we are describing as an indigenous journalist in simple terms if you belong to if you identify yourself as a member of an indigenous a tribal uh, community then you are an indigenous journalist um okay uh, there is one question uh, I'm not a tribe and have an NGO. Okay, this this uh, question, there is a question from Pradeep Kuruturi. Uh, Pradeep, your question is not for our panelists today. I would encourage you to ask questions that our panelists can answer. Uh, there is one question that says, there are religious conversions in rampant in tribal regions of India and it's very sensitive issue. They are taking advantage of their poverty and converting them into giving free gifts, which is destroying their culture. How can this be dealt? Okay, so we are, if I may uh, remind the, the uh, person who asked this, Today, we are not talking about religion or politics. We are here to discuss land rights and uh, the, the struggle of uh, the indigenous people uh, it, it, to, to defend their land rights, as well as how all of this is tied very closely to the biodiversity of this nation, of this region. But uh, if I may uh, take a second to answer uh, this question is, uh, when there is, uh, you know, when there are uh, violations of human rights, when I think uh, Annabella and Bestan kind of hinted at it, when people are, uh, you know, losing their rights, losing their land, when there is poverty, there comes in exploitation. This can be religious exploitation, this can be economic exploitation. So if you want to check on exploitation, you probably should be looking at the causes, the, 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 the root causes of it and ask your question to those that are behind, uh, you know, these reasons. Um, oh, there is a question, I'm not quite sure if this is a question, could we find uh, connections with Philippine journalists? I don't know what this question means or who probably it is for best town. Uh, so I don't know what this question means. Does it mean that uh, if best town is available uh, to Filipino journalists, 
Uh, Bestang, would you like to answer how uh, a, a journalist in Philippines can contact you? Hi, hello. Yes, thank you for the questions. Uh, I think the question is more addressed to the Earth Journalism Network, like uh, your help in linking us with more journalists like in the Philippines. But yes, definitely uh, that kind of, of initiative and support will be very helpful for us, like to introduce to us more journalists that may be able to cover our stories both from the Philippines and even uh, well within the Earth Journalism Network and beyond. Uh, Bestang, stay with us because uh, we have one more question that I think uh, you can you can take on. Uh, although this question is for all three of our panelists, I would first take it to you, Bestang. The question is, um, uh, can I can't read it right now. Let me. Uh, okay, yeah. Can you suggest any good model of a particular national government that are doing better in balancing both development and tribal empowerments with the respect to land rights? So, Estang, if you have a good uh, example you know, or, or maybe a best practice, a good example, a positive example where yeah. of a balancing act. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you Pradeep for the question. This was actually asked earlier uh, and I also uh, pitched in some ideas or, 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 or answers. But yeah, for me, the main question is development for whom? And this needs to be addressed more seriously by governments because it should not be for private companies, for especially for transnational companies like I uh, shared in, in, in the experiences of the Cordillera in, our, in the Philippines. You know? So like for instance, if we do mining, because in our region, we do have mining. In fact, mining, gold mining has been a part of our culture, but this is small scale. This is community developed uh, and this the benefits the whole communities that are involved in the practice of uh, this small scale gold mining. So if we do mining, then it should be for the benefit of the local people and not for you know, the transnational companies, the, the rich, uh, because what is happening at the moment is that all these mining operations are private, are owned by uh, corporations. So the, the profits goes to them. It does not even go to the Philippine government, for, for instance. You know? that's, that's why I said that the question here is, for whom is, that, is the development uh, that we are talking about? And this is the one that should be seriously addressed by governments. And this has been raised by civil society organizations in, in many occasions, even at the international level. Uh, well, in the Philippines, it takes, and I think this is the same in, in other countries, it takes uh, system change, which is not very easy, but we can get there if we support each other and continue the fight. Uh, like for instance, de we develop our national industries because this helps the people, the, the, especially the poor, this helps alleviate poverty. Let us not rely, the government should not rely on export, import oriented uh, economies. Let us recycle jewelries. If we need copper, if we need gold, there's a lot already that has been mined for many centuries and it's just out there being displayed in the bodies of the rich, you know, the, those kinds of things. Let us recycle uh, even the discarded electronic gadgets, which means that uh, we should also give up some of um, the most treasured jewelries, for instance, because the more, the more needs uh, the necessities, the needs of the people are what should be addressed by the government and not the uh, interests of the few uh, ruling elites and the rich. Hmm. I'm not sure if there's a government at the moment that's doing a, a good practice on that. <laughs> but yeah, that's my op opinion. Uh, yeah, I think uh, best thing this reminds me that there is there isn't a thing called a perfect country or a perfect government, but there can be a good perfect example of coordinated effort to to make it better. 
So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, Pradeep, if uh, I don't know if there is an absolute answer to your question, but I think what Best Bengali said is that if there are more people coming together uh, and and highlighting the issue and make a you know better example, make make a better effort to 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 find a solution, then probably uh, you know case by case uh, things can get better. Uh, Annabella. Um, I know Annabella uh, uh, is our, uh, she uh, is mostly, uh, she's mainly a Spanish speaker and uh, we are uh, not, uh, unfortunately not able to give Annabella a chance to speak in Spanish. So, so she has been speaking in English, Annabella, but uh, still I would ask you the same question. Do you know of any, any case, any example in Mexico where you think the government was very fair um, in, you know, to the indigenous people. Is there any case example where everything was correct, everything was right? Mm, as far I know, I don't think so. I don't know this about that experiences. Because if there is a good case, probably we will know. At least I don't know. Okay, uh, Diana, any anything that you have heard of or you, you have reported? There's no case that I know of, none where everything went right? No. Uh, yeah, um, I can uh, actually share an example from, from India. Uh, so as COVID, uh, you know, hit, a pandemic hit us and the country went into lockdown, uh, we heard of a case uh, in one of uh, the East, Northeast uh, Indian uh, states called Assam. Uh, which is also the largest tea producing uh, states. And it has a large uh, population of indigenous people. So uh, one fine day we woke up uh, hearing that the state government had proposed um, uh, to bring in, and it's not a law because a law uh, is that goes through different uh, legislative uh, procedure. Uh, phases, but this was an ordinance, so it's more, most like uh, something that is kind of bypasses the, the standard uh, legislative uh, procedure. So yeah, the government was proposing to uh, introduce uh, a policy uh, where uh, it would be possible for the industrial, uh, you know, the industries to take over uh, or buy indigenous land, which is currently not allowed. You cannot just go in and buy land in indigenous territories, but that policy would have uh, allowed uh, for that, uh, for, you know, uh, enabling uh, corporations to our industrial houses to buy land in the indigenous territories, provided they also uh, start, you know, some, some, you know, keep aside a portion for the local development, which is basically uh, something that was uh, uh, that was uh, not taken very uh, kindly. Uh, but the fact is that the whole country was into lockdown, so this issue could have uh, easily died. Uh, you know, could have stay uh, stayed unreported, but surprisingly, it did not go unreported. Uh, the indigenous uh, communities, indigenous voices um, from all sections of the society came pretty together strongly. And um, the, there was a very, <clears throat> you know, a great uh, collaborative effort by uh, academics, by um, intellectuals, by as well as by journalists, so everybody kind of came together to highlight this and protest this. And then the, 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 uh, 
the, poly, the uh, you know, the ordinance was actually withdrawn. So I would say that it was a very difficult phase and yet uh, it could have very easily uh, gone ahead and become a law or, you know, and uh, get implemented, but, but that did not happen only because everybody did come together and media, uh, I think, uh, gave the support that was expected of uh, it. Uh, so that is one, one of the very rare cases that I know of, and it, it happened pretty recently. But yes, uh, as, as a country, I don't know of any, any country that has kind of gotten everything right. But yes, some Pradeep says that, you know, it doesn't have to be best, just to be better. So I think when everybody plays their role and they come together, and uh, the media also reports in an informed way. And as Diana also said, not just interview the opinion leader, but also the experts. So when we do, uh, when everybody's voices is represented well, I think uh, there is there can be better effort and probably lead to uh, some better examples. Uh, uh, just uh, wondering if uh, there are any other questions anybody wants to raise. Uh, any, and, and any other messages that our panelists want to share today. Uh, one thing that I, I'm still curious about is, uh, Annabella, if you could tell a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, wh what, what does, uh, you know, how do we, Yaki people, what kind of role Yaki people play in, in, in the conservation of local biodiversity? That is something I would love to hear about from you. Okay. Well, our land is uh, like four, 400,085 hectares or acres. And they have traditional guard, like safeguarding the, against the against hunters and other, other kind of uh, illegal like uh, mining like uh, like what else um other kind of resources without their permission of the tribal authorities and we also just monitoring uh, wildlife because uh, we wanted to have it like almost pristine and because there are the remains or the bones remind of our ancestors is still there and there are sacred places. So we like, we really want to have it uh, in that way. That's why we don't want mining in there because our sacred places will go on. We will, we'll go on. We'll, we don't want that. So we are really, taking care of it, but sometimes we are not <clears throat> keeping really on it because organized crime is like getting over our traditional guard. They are more powerful and we don't have the same power as them. Mm. But we are trying to do our best to keep it, the biodiversity of our land. Okay. And not only the traditional, but only also the any people. If I see an illegal hunter, I will go and tell and say and do something about it because it's our obligation to defend or to take care of our land. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Annabella. Thank you, uh, Diana. Thank you, Bestang. One question that I want to ask to each of you is. Uh, um, uh, your, I know your, uh, you shared your PowerPoints, uh, Diana and Bestang, and uh, we will be sharing them uh, with all those who participated and registered with us today. Uh, Annabella, if if one of our one of uh, the journalists who joined us today, or uh, you know registered uh, for this event, wants to reach to you. Uh, you know, uh, what is the best way to, to reach you uh, by, by anyone, uh, any journalist? 
to reach me by email, I think so. And also if you have my, I, I don't know if you have my cell phone, I can share it too. Okay, so uh, so so people can email you, right? That way they can, uh, yeah. Um, before, uh, I have one more question before uh, we wrap it up for the day. Uh, Annabella, as you are, you are also actually a lawyer. So um, <clears throat> earlier, uh, Diana talked about how do things get right as a journalist. From a lawyer's perspective, uh, what are the legal uh, points that you think a journalist should look into when they are reporting on an indigenous people's issue? Mm, okay, when indigenous peoples are fighting their rights and they are recognized in several international instruments, but when indigenous people saying it is like it's not enough i had it, there must be someone else with a powerful voice to say the same thing to talk about that instrumental international law or other law is give like a more power to the to their voice i think you can do it like that or Yes, maybe maybe that they can say because it's my I'm not been really practicing my English. It's sometimes it's like very difficult to <laughs> to say it, but I think a power for journalists of also saying the same thing that as indigenous peoples talking about our rights, it will help a lot. Hmm. Yeah, I think we 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 heard you well, Annabella, that before uh, or, or while reporting on an indigenous issue, it is very important for a journalist to look at the at, at what are the legalities? What, what does the law say? That is the simple question here. And when we are talking about law, it's not enough to just look at the international law or maybe not enough to look at the uh, regional law. There is an international law as well. So look at it from uh, all the all the different angles. What does the international law says on this? What are the uh, what what is the specific regional law? And as well as what is the customary law of that particular region where a particular community uh, lives? Um, for the knowledge of everybody who have joined us, um, uh, there are countries where the law is very different. Uh, on specific issues, for example, we have heard that uh, in Vietnam, when it comes to forest forest laws uh, or the ownership to the land in, in, in forest areas, there is one set of laws that are recognized or uh, followed by a specific district or a specific region, but the countrywide, the law is very different. And there are journalists now who are going to uh, study and investigate you know, how the difference between these two specific laws are affecting uh, the conservation of biodiversity, affecting the indigenous people uh, there. And they're doing this story uh, just before the country is about to revise its forest laws. So sometimes it becomes very uh, strategically, very wise and intelligent, you know, brilliant if you look at a particular uh, law and its status of implementation in the indigenous territories, when the country is probably proposing a policy reform or is studying its current law and proposing some changes, because then you have the maximum uh, you know, uh, chances of making an impact. And Earth Journalism Network has just committed to fund, you know, uh, so financially support that particular story that I just mentioned in Vietnam. So please, again, do pitch in your, your, sto your story ideas and, uh, and, and please uh, apply, not just for this indigenous story, but do keep following us on social media and our do register on our website and do keep applying for our uh, you know future uh, story grants
uh, I think we have reached our uh, almost. We are at the eighty. <laughs> we're eighty sixth. Uh, Minute. Uh, so we have uh, four minutes still left. Uh, uh, Diana, uh, uh, you were a EJN story grantee, and <laughs> now you are uh, you joined us to share your experiences. Uh, and I think you spoke for many of uh, those who joined us today. So thank you very much for me being with us. Uh, yeah, uh, Bessam. It's very late. It's uh, actually it's almost midnight yes. <laughs> in the Philippines. <laughs> and you're you're still here, so so I should thank you. You know, twice actually. I can't thank you enough for 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 your time and staying with us till this long. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity. And if I may add, you know, there's so many things that I wanted to say, but <laughs> uh, but one final point, you know, journalists in the Philippines are also repressed. Um, and you may have heard already about this. So if the network can support these Philippine journalists, that would be so much appreciated. Like, for instance, if they, for whatever reason, uh, if they cannot write about our stories, it would be good for those who are based outside of the Philippines to be the ones doing it. That is, I think, one of the importance of the Earth Journalism Network and its other contacts. Thank you. Yes, yes, the cyber uh, uh, libel laws in, in Philippines have indeed, uh, you know, come out rather strongly against <laughs> not just uh, Maria Ressa, but many others, uh, many other journalists. And yes, collaboration is something that is uh, gaining more and more importance across the world. Um, so thank you, Bestang, for, for remembering that. And yes, uh, please, uh, and if anybody wants to, uh, you know, Bestang is your person, she, she's there, please do reach out to uh, Bestang anytime that you want to do a report on the land rights in indigenous territories or in anything to related to the, the rights of indigenous peoples in the Philippines. Um, and the same goes to Annabella. Annabella, first of all, I did not say this before, but it's never too late to uh, say that how happy uh, we are that you made it uh, safe and alive uh, from that uh, terrible uh, situation uh, in a few years ago. So you could be here today. Um, I know you survived that intimidating tactics that many other journalists and even uh, many other activists and even journalists face today across the world. One of my colleagues in Peru has 21 cases filed against her just for reporting on mining. Uh, so, <laughs> so you are not alone, Annabella or Bestang. Journalists are also, you know, uh, carrying the this, this same burden of litigation. And I think uh, the best way to overcome this is that we come together and uh, we uh, do reporting that is factually correct and we do it with honesty and integrity. And yes, and as, as uh, Diana said, that we need to do it, contextualize it locally. We have to tell a story that is for the people that we are with, the people that are meant for, people you know, who are right in the middle of the story. So with that, I will thank you again, all of our panelists. Thank you all those who joined us today. Thank you all those who have introduced yourselves in the chat box. Uh, very happy to meet you all. Thank you who have asked our, you know, your questions. Please stay in touch. Please uh, keep in touch with our panelists also and to apply for our story grant. And finally, I thank you, my all my colleagues who have given us the tech support. They are not in front of the camera, but they have brought us this far uh, in this webinar. So with that, again, good night and good day, good evening and good morning to all, especially Annabella, who's just starting the day. So see you again and goodbye.